the examination of mobile device data should be proportionally similar to computer examinations, but unfortunately, this is not the case. In actuality, computer evidence is still more prevalently used in civil and criminal cases, but use of mobile device evidence is on the rise, though not at the rate of induction of the actual devices. In fact, in each and every venue in which law enforcement has been surveyed, participants have unequivocally stated that they receive more requests for the analysis of mobile device data than for any other type of electronic evidence. A common theme with mobile forensic experts in both law enforcement and enterprises is the overwhelming inundation of electronic evidence from mobile devices, which is increasing at an alarming rate, so much so that the groups I've surveyed from both law enforcement and corporate organizations indicate that they've hired or assigned specialists who examine and collect only data from mobile devices. What is truly alarming is the fact that most of these examiners also indicated that little consideration is given to the actual content of the mobile device when a computer is also part of the electronic evidence scene. The proliferation of mobile devices will only increase with the world's population growth and as the population's dependency on technology accelerates. Now should be the time to accept and understand that the information contained on a mobile device details, documents, and exposes the thoughts, actions, and deeds of a user substantially more than any data stored on a personal computer. It is widely known that today's digital forensics examinations have been dumbed down, with a heavy reliance placed on using tools to extract and collect data. These methods have bred a systemic influx of data collectors, rather than mobile device forensic examiners. This book attempts to counter this trend as it approaches and readies not only the newest examiners, but seasoned digital experts as well, with skills and knowledge that surpass the simple easy button approach. The successful examination of digital evidence from a mobile device requires an intimate understanding of the data, and not the medium that produced it. This fact is especially important when it comes to the examination of the artifacts left behind by a mobile device. Often the unique aspects of mobile devices are overlooked by examiners and students when encountering these small-scale digital devices, because their first impressions are often clouded by the actual size of the device. It is a common belief that the small size of the device implies that it contains only primitive and rudimentary data, and this equates to the belief that the examination of the device should be consistent with its physical size. The size of today's device has no bearing on the storage, however, with most of today's smart devices having a storage capacity far greater than that of PCs less than 10 years ago. In practice, many believe data forensics should be as easy as inserting a flash drive and hitting the Find Evidence button. However, because of this tactic, most examiners, and quite honestly the majority of examinations, fail at the critical part of the evidence life cycle, the dissemination of the facts. In short, the size of today's modern smart device is in no way an indication of its storage capacity. Moreover, it is important to remember that although the physical device that holds the data may be different, the data and artifacts produced by the underlying operating system are what the examiner must focus on. An examiner who must testify to his or her findings will quickly realize that it is not acceptable to testify to the fact that he or she pushed the get evidence button and then believe that the resulting reasoning explanation will suffice in court. An examiner must be ready to answer the question, where did the phone book come from, and not answer, from the phone. The true expert digital forensics witness will be ready to give the location of the phone book's contents as they relate to the phone's file system and to specify how the user data was not altered during the examination. Unfortunately, for most, this is a daunting task because it takes additional training, for which many admit they have neither the time nor the resources. Volatile Memory and the Visor PDA A great example of volatile memory and mobile devices is the Visor Personal Digital Assistant PDA. With the technology of all PDAs at the time, most had a whopping 8 MB of RAM and did not store data for long if no power was supplied. Example, a visor seized in a search warrant was brought in for examination. The power cradle had been left at the scene, and it was a Friday, so the device was going to have to sit in the evidence locker until the following Monday. Upon arriving back at the lab on Monday, the examiner tried to start the device, but it was immediately apparent that the device had lost all power, it would not boot up. A power cradle was located for the device at a local store and the device was charged. When there was significant power to the device, the examination continued. 
To the dismay of the examiner, there was nothing on the device, no user content anywhere. What was puzzling was the fact that a substantial amount of data had existed on the device and was outlined and documented by the officers who seized it. Had someone broken into the lab over the weekend and deleted the data from the device? Had the officer somehow deleted the data or caused it to self-destruct? The visor documentation was consulted, as well as manufacturer's documentation, which indicated that PDAs drew constant power to keep the data on the devices populated. If the device was allowed to be completely drained of power, the data would no longer be available. Because the data resided in the device's RAM, the data was volatile, and, as such, when power was lost, the data stored in RAM was also lost. It was a hard lesson to learn but a great example of the limitations of volatile memory. Moving forward, all devices had to have their power maintained, if possible, and most training courses on mobile forensics began to preach this lesson as well. Instruction on the use of portable charging units during transport as well as during storage began to be included in training courses and digital forensic examination kits. Mobile devices in the media every day, the World Media Reports cases solved using evidence from mobile devices or stories about how a mobile device was involved in a crime, either a text message or chat was sent or received, a social media post was sent or interpreted, or a voicemail was heard, recorded, or hacked. Mobile device data is today's equivalent to yesterday's DNA evidence. One day, a mobile device that shows up in the lab or in the field may hold data that has never been seen by the world, the grassy knoll, the shot heard round the world, the missing plane's last communication, and the smoking gun. Quite simply, you can fill in the blank to determine what a mobile device might be involved in when contemplating the events of today. Digital data from a mobile device holds the key. To the forensic examiner, this data is critical in many investigations. The sidebar, mobile devices on the scene, details the relevance of data on a mobile device and how its recovery is critical. Right blockers and mobile devices NIST and its computer forensics tool testing program specifically state that the central requirement of a proper forensic procedure is that the examined original evidence must not be changed or modified in any way. One of NIST's listed requirements for a layered defense is to use a hard disk write blocker tool to intercept any inadvertent disk writes. A write blocker is a software or hardware device that stops specific communication from a computer to a mass storage device. Write blockers come in many different types. Software-based write blockers can use a simple Windows registry change, hardware units or sophisticated boxes that are coupled to the examination computer via cables, with the device to be examined attached to the other side. Some allow a connection directly to the pins located on the actual hard drive and then to the computer conducting the forensic analysis, while others have USB connections to plug a removable USB hard drive or flash drive into an available port. Software write blocking tools also block the writing to attached drives plugged into the USB drive, mounted drives, and by device classes, if needed. Essentially, the write blocker acts as a traffic signal to data requests made by the computer. The computer makes requests to receive data from the connected device, which are accepted and processed, if a request to write data to the protected device on the other side of the write protector is made, these requests are stopped and not allowed to reach the device. The write blocking hardware or software tool is not considered forensically sound, but the employment of the device and methods as part of the process is. From data transfer to data forensics adding and deleting user data would never be something a forensic examiner would desire, a fact that was realized by companies developing sync data transfer software. So these companies began to create models and versions that were intended for the forensic examiner. The software and hardware were no different from the SYNC software, with one exception, the write, transfer button or selection was not enabled. These devices and applications simply allowed the data to be read from the device, not written to it. Sometimes the forensics updates involved a removal of a button, and sometimes it was merely adding new instructions in the manual. Processes and procedures if automated tools will be used in any forensic examination of digital data, examiners must have a set of processes and procedures in place, using an automated tool without such direction could be a detriment to the entire process. 
An understanding of the processes and procedures of mobile device forensics is required in this age of mobile computing because of the many automated tools, variances among them, lack of complete coverage, and diverse training levels. Ultimately, understanding the processes and the steps needed, interpreting results, analyzing output, and documenting the data, all while maintaining case integrity, should be the goals. People use mobile devices every day to buy groceries, send birthday wishes, break up with a lover, transfer millions of dollars, and unfortunately commit crimes. Gaining an intimate knowledge of how to collect valuable data from these devices, uncover valuable data, and present the data will put you ahead of the rest. Examination awareness and progression When mobile devices contained volatile data storage, the only examination of the mobile device consisted of removing the SIM card and reading the information stored on it. This made for a quick examination of the smart chip, and the device was seldom examined forensically. So essentially the first introduction anyone had to the examination of a mobile device started at the SIM card. The first software for mobile device collection also read the data from a SIM card. Cameras eventually began to play a role in the documentation of data for mobile devices. Important SMS messages, images, or contacts could be documented using a webcam or digital camera. These images were then placed into a report for review. Several companies built systems to enable the examiner to lay out the evidence, document the size, and more. Software applications such as BitPim, initially developed by Roger Bins, is a perfect example. Bins created an application that would enable him to transfer data, primarily his contacts, from an old phone to a new phone. BitPim was limited mostly to CDMA devices, but because protocols were based upon the Qualcomm chipset, some Samsung GSM devices could be supported as well. GSM devices, however, were never officially supported by BitPim, and the software's last official build was on January 24, 2010. Applications such as Paraben Cell Seizure, TULP2G, SIMCON, and MobileEdit began to be used in training courses and forensic labs around the world. These applications gathered data from mobile devices by using the same protocols reverse engineered from tools such as Nokia Suite and Samsung PC Suite. Today, as in the beginning, the same problem exists, not all mobile devices are supported by a single solution. Now, bring in drones, IoT, Internet of Things, devices, wearables, infotainment, and other mobile-to-mobile -mobile M2M devices, and the extraction and examination issues are only exacerbated. There is not and will not be a single solution to extract and collect data from all digital mobile devices, simply because there are too many kinds of devices, and new devices are being added and changed continuously. Examiners in the beginning of the mobile forensic timeline had two types of evidence to process, a SIM card and the mobile device. Sometimes the only data that could be collected from a mobile device came from a SIM card. There were, and still are, many variables to be considered, did the actual device even have a connection to communicate with the software? Did the device store data internally? More importantly, was the device even supported? At this time, a new trend emerged, devices were now capable of holding data on a removable card, known as a memory card. Yes, the first cards were not micro SD cards, but large PCMIA, Personal Computer Memory Card International Association, cards primarily used for PCs. These obviously were very large, so transitioning to compact flash CF, cards moved them from the PC to the camera and into the many PDA devices for storage. With the addition of removable media, mobile device forensics expanded to three pieces of evidence to collect during any examination. CF cards are still available, but the secure digital SD cards are now most prevalent in mobile devices. These small SD cards range in storage capacity, but the devices of today are no longer limited to reading 128GB, 256GB, or even 400GB, some devices tout the ability to read 2TB cards. Obviously, devices can contain multiple SD cards or SIM cards, but the primary items to be examined and collected will remain the same, device, SIM, removable media, and sometimes a backup of the mobile device that is located on another type of media, such as a PC. Today's mobile devices primarily use the micro SD card as the de facto external storage medium. 
With the ability to extract and decode data from the cloud, today's examiner now has an additional repository for mobile device evidence. Digital devices for years have been storing data on servers located around the globe. This fact is easily observable every time a user upgrades to a new mobile device. The user simply downloads the app to the new device, signs in, and all his or her history magically appears within the app, kindly planting the server's data contents on the new device. Only recently have mobile device examiners had easy access to these endpoint storage cabinets with automated software. So now add another evidence area the savvy examiner must become familiar with. To determine whether a device contains both internal and external SD card components, research the device before starting your examination. Mobile device backups The last type of associated data for mobile devices is the backup that some devices create on media such as PCs, Macs, and other operating systems. Today's devices also use the cloud to store backups. Devices such as Apple iPhone and iPad and the new BlackBerry smartphones create backups that you can later analyze. Apple iOS devices create a backup using the Apple iTunes software. You'll find these backups in different locations depending on the type of computer operating system and version. For Windows computers, the backup default location for an Apple iOS device will depend on the operating system version. A series of files and folders are created for the iOS device backups at these storage positions. If the user has elected to encrypt backups via the iTunes interface, the backups will not be readable unless the iTunes password is known. A user can always change the backup location using the BlackBerry backup software. Both iOS and BlackBerry backups contain very valuable data that you can analyze in commercial tools such as Oxygen Forensic Detective and Analyst MSABXRY, and Celebrite Physical Analyzer, along with free tools such as iPhone Backup Browser and Magic Berry. The collection and analysis of backups can assist your investigation if the device cannot be located or accessed, but examinations of the backups are also a way to compare the data from the backup to the actual device for a historical perspective.